with trauma and stress. Um, because if you're witnessing yourself doing something, that also takes you away from the emotional intensity. If I'm asking you to notice your upsetness, it automatically drops the level of the upsetness because for you to be able to take part of your brain and notice what's going on, you can't be in that emotional intensity. And so two of the things that are important for working in this way are to learn to um, notice sensation and felt sense and also to be able to develop a part of you that is able to stand back and look at what's happening. So then you become, you notice your pain as opposed to being your pain. Or you notice the emotion of anger as opposed to being the anger. Um, and I think you can pretty well understand that distinction. Um, Suzanne, yeah. do you want to explain what neuroception means? Uh, um, yes, but can you hold the question? Sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we're going to kind of switch into uh, what is trauma. So I'm, I've, I've given two definitions here, and you have those in your handout. But um, it is uh, nature's, trauma is by nature terrifying and completely overwhelming. Something is happening that you cannot control and it feels big enough to destroy you. Your awareness that you are endangered is an essential ingredient of trauma. And I am underlined a word here because it's very important. It is the perception of a direct threat. Now that doesn't mean that it might not be a direct threat, but it's the perception of the direct threat to your life, your well-being, or your sanity that marks trauma. A person feels completely helpless and ineffective of what is perceived to be overwhelming danger. There are big T and little t traumas. Uh, examples include divorce, betrayal, loss of a job or business, death of a person, accidents that are not life-threatening and those that are, natural disasters, sexual assault or abuse, and childhood traumas. Now, I, I, um, I know all of you, if you have any siblings or even if you've had conversation with people in your family, can think of an event that might have been an interesting event where you, you have two people telling the same story about the event and one person was very affected by it and the other person was like, what's the big deal? You're both in the same place at the same time, but your nervous systems or your ability for your nervous system to interpret, this is neuroception, safety in the field is very different. So what I want to stress here is there is no judgment about trauma. What is traumatic for one person may not be for another person, whether it's a little t or a big t. And um, one of the things that's very helpful is to normalize it. It's a neurological response. And it's not about your being a bad person or anything else because you couldn't deal with it. Everybody's nervous system is wired differently and how you respond to an outside event and how you perceive it is what is the key to whether or not it becomes a traumatic or stressful event for you. And it's different for every person. So one of the things that any of us working in this field need to realize is we, we have, you've got to leave your judgment at the door. You know, you cannot come in and say to somebody, well, what was the big whoop? You know, and, and so an example might be somebody sitting in the green zone in Baghdad who never saw combat but comes home just as traumatized as somebody who's out on a combat mission because of that constant wondering, is somebody going to attack me? Okay, just as an example. So when we're dealing with trauma, what might that look like? Okay. So trauma symptoms have um, memory component, and so we're going to go over some of the different aspects to recognize. I'm sure some of them you're aware of. We're just going to be a little bit more thorough with them right now. So symptoms of intrusive memories. Well, on the big kind of news report, we might hear about flashbacks, and that's kind of the big headline, but underneath that might be what it's like to keep reliving the trauma over and over. 
In other words, I just keep thinking about it, just keep picturing it, it just keeps coming in my dreams. Somehow it just shows up. I see somebody that looks like somebody, now I'm starting to think about it. Other things keep triggering the reliving of the feelings of, the picture of, the sensations of the trauma that happened. Um, yeah, so dreams, senses, and triggers might not always be what you think they are. Right? It might not just be, oh, watching that intense similar scene on the television news report. It might be somebody whispering next to you because at the same time in that scene, somebody was whispering next to you and all of a sudden you feel yourself in a hyper-aroused state and you don't even know why. So a lot of the triggers we are, people are not necessarily aware of. And they just know they feel hypervisual, they feel hyper-responsive and over-aroused and they don't know. And very often in AFT sessions, for example, we will find out, oh my God, I didn't even get that 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 triggers me now was in that traumatic event. And it's really important when those get discovered and understood. <clears throat> Symptoms of anxiety and increased emotional arousal also might include easy irritability over small things, which you don't think are small, anger or rage, overwhelming guilt or shame. I shouldn't have been the one that escaped it. I shouldn't have been there. I said I wasn't going to be, and I was. I should, all kinds of sources for shame and guilt. Self-destructive behaviors, uh, all kinds of addictive behaviors. Whether it be drinking, whether it be drugs, whether it be infidelity, whether it be, I mean, there's so many different aspects of um, addictive behaviors to try to find some relief from the pain. Right, and that's really what they are at the heart of it, is I want relief from this inner anxiety, this inner hole, this inner pain, this inner suffering, I need some way to find that even if I only know that it's temporary, I am drawn to that like a moth to a flame to find some relief. Difficulty sleeping because that part doesn't stop. It's incessant. Being easily startled and frightened, speaking to that hypervigilance because one doesn't know when all of a sudden that safety is going to be gone so I never feel safe and at any time something can be there to take my safety away. So it is my, in my best interest, in my mind, to constantly watch out for that which isn't safe. And so being easily jumped, easily startled um, is very common. Hearing and seeing things that aren't there, um, that's taking it to a little bit of extreme, but voices, thoughts, thoughts that become voices, you know, those are taking it to the farther end of the spectrum, but it's still included. Um, some symptoms of um, cycling. So very often, especially with PTSD, what wasn't understood for a long time, and, and Stephen Porges and many others really speak to this well, is what's called the cycling or the roller coaster. From this hyper arousal response to this complete dead response. So in other words, it didn't make sense psychologically for a long time how somebody could be in a rage and easily triggered and then all of a sudden they're just flat zone and don't feel anything. So on the other side of that hyper arousal, this hypo arousal is the sense of emotional numbing or avoiding sensation of feeling anything. So trying to avoid thinking or talking about anything with regarding the trauma. Shut down, very hard especially for families and spouses of those that return with stress from the military, right? Because they just don't want to deal with the feelings. Feeling emotionally numb, avoiding activities that bring joy, perhaps out of guilt or shame that they shouldn't be able to feel joy. So avoiding, so their lives often become much smaller. Hopelessness, very common. Hopelessness about the future, given the past. Running, when they hear sounds. <laughs> but nobody else hears. Um, Memory problems, troubles concentrating, and especially, you know, such a huge issue with this is death is the difficulty in maintaining healthy relationships when one is cycling from rage and self-destructive behaviors and inability to feel and not wanting to feel and run and just really hard. This is like a moving target that makes being in a healthy relationship really, really difficult. Okay. Okay. Um, the trauma capsule. Raise your hand if you know the term. Okay, for those that don't. So this work is um, most known through the work of Robert Scare, who I had the privilege of interviewing. So I have a radio show called Change Your Mind, The Transformational Dialogues. And I've just had an amazing privilege. I just 
got a yes from Gabriel Mate, who we're going to be interviewing at. And we're really excited. And got to have uh, some time with Robert Sicker. And he's really um, most well known for this work of the trauma capsule. So I'm going to read some of this first and then define it a little further. So um, this comes from his work directly. It's vital to recognize that our memories of a traumatic event reflect the event precisely once we get in that capsule. So what we've got is a sharply defined and bounded state or a capsule containing all of the pertinent stored memories for each traumatic experience that we've endured, especially all the sensations, the sights, the sounds, the feelings, all of those things get stored in this capsule that then often are below our level of consciousness until, for example, in a session like EFT when they get opened and all of a sudden people start remembering details that was not conscious to them in their normal daily lives. When these kinds of memories arise, they corrupt the present moment by inserting past events into the present perception. If the original trauma was severe enough, such as an assault, it can feel as though one's actually reliving a horrifying past event as in a flashback. The past event is perceived as happening in present time. This is really important because this is what happens when a capsule opens or when a memory is triggered, when a, a traumatic event happens, and it feels as if it's happening now. And all of a sudden, that left brain linear time ability is not doing so well. That's when that right brain activation happens, and the past is the present. It is happening. All the feelings of the past event are happening in the present. I feel this. I feel my body like this. I'm thinking these thoughts. It's just like I was there. So when we're working with trauma, and we're working with trauma capsules, it's really important to understand that, for example, um, a veteran might start to talk about an event that was happening that was very traumatic, and they may just skate over it like they're figure skating, right over it. Oh yeah, this happened, and this happened, and then the bomb came, and this happened, I smelled this, felt this, stuff. and it's, they're not really being present to it because it's as if it's encapsulated or insisted, in a cyst, and we have to really, really slow them down, and we'll talk more about that, because when we really open the capsule and then they're flooded, we need to be able to help them to resource and regulate themselves so we can really neutralize each step of the way, and we'll talk more about that. When we're working with the trauma, oh, look at that, it's a perfect analogy. It's, it's like we're working with an onion, and want, we want to be careful not to chop the onion wide open because it can be incredibly intense and traumatizing. So the number one rule when we're working with trauma, be it trauma, PTSD, and the whole spectrum, slow and gentle and one layer at a time is so incredibly important from my perspective in the work that we do. Um, it's imperative that we begin at the outside edge. We slowly work into the capsule or memory or story like peeling the layers of an onion. We'll be talking more about EFT techniques in which we take one step. We make sure that that step and retelling that part of the story is okay and neutralized. Then we go to the next step. There will be the tendency, as Alina calls it, and it's spoken of as a trauma pull, to get pulled right in by a person because they so want to heal the intensity of what happened to them that they will bring you right into the middle. And we can't do that because that physiologically would not allow them to heal. So as a practitioner, on whatever level that we're working with somebody, especially with the NFT, we have to slow them down so that we are working from the outside in from one layer at a time. Mm. Okay. Anything you'd like to add? Except the next slide, there you go. That one's yours. So, um, some of this work that we're not going into today in terms of the detail of how to do somatic work with somebody who has severe trauma, however, is doable by anyone. And they're the first couple of steps in working with trauma. And so we present these to you today. So, the first thing, whether you're a therapist working with somebody with severe trauma or an EFT practitioner, is to establish safety for the person. And um, to set clear boundaries. And by that I mean, in part, making sure they feel safe with the boundaries. 
So how close you sit to someone, how far away, making sure they feel comfortable. They may not be comfortable facing you. They may want to be on an angle. And it's up to you to check in with them to first of all say, is there anything else you need to make you to, for this place to be a safe place? Is there anything I need to do to help you feel more safe? So you really want to make sure that you have a space that's overlapping because remember, we are humans, we are wired for connection. So you as a connector are going to be a very important person in that field where the neurons are coming back and forth. So you need to feel safe, you need to feel resourced, balanced, and you need for them to feel as much as is possible for them to be happy where they are, in the room with you, or not in the room with you. Okay, thank you. So the first thing here, and this is the work of uh, Sharon Stanley, who lives on Bainbridge Island. Um, so this is her four steps, but um, they're, so I'm using them. But the first is to establish somatic empathy. That is not sympathy. Okay, it's not feeling sorry for the other person. But it's about an ability for you to be in a calm resource state and to be open for them to be where they need to be. So empathy is about being present to the other person but staying in yourself. Does that make sense? Okay. So one of the things you want to make sure is that when you come into a session, you're grounded, you're ready to work, you're completely present. And from that state, the empathy will be, will be able to flow. Okay? And this is another reason why the meditation stuff has been such a big boom, because it actually helps all of us to practice developing better empathy. that when one has found, when is working with EFT, one of the beauties of that is that we are self-soothing, we are self-resourcing in the state of working with another person as well. So it's a, it's a place that helps that. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, the second piece is somatic inquiry, and by now you're beginning to see why EFT works in this capacity. So first, in, in actually in the inquiry, is to listen deeply to truly listen to what the person is saying. And Craig is going to talk about the application of EFT to these general principles, so I will leave that piece to him. But um, So developing your listening skills is a really, really important piece of this. And to begin to explore mind-body connections. As you talk about this, where do you notice it in your body? Now, there are some exceptions to that rule, and uh, this is not really the place to go into them, but uh, all I would say is if they're not comfortable going into their body, don't force them. Don't ever ask anybody to go anywhere they do not want to go. That's part of the safety thing. But you want to begin to explore mind-body connections and also to ask open questions. So, when you notice that you're anxious, what else do you notice? So, not questions that ask for a yes or no answer, but questions that help to open up the exploration or the inquiry, and to help to open up insight, and to help to open up what you as an EFT practitioner are then going to work on as the setup statement, for instance. Then the intervention, which is the actual use of um, different uh, tools, different somatic tools. In this case, it, it'll be EFT. And um, so the intervention is going to be how you work to initially, or in small increments, bring, help to bring the client back to a regulated nervous system state which in EFT looks like zero suds level. So there's no emotional intensity around whatever it is you've just been addressing. And um, 
what you're doing with that is you're slowly, in very small steps, rewiring so that there is no emotional intensity around the trauma. It's not like you're going to forget what happened, but you won't have any emotional charge around it anymore. And I, and I distinguish between feeling and emotional charge. You know, you might feel it, but you're not gonna, it's not gonna throw you out of a regulated nervous state. Okay, you will be able to think about it, and to hold it and it may be a little uncomfortable, but it doesn't throw you into either hyperarousal or hypoarousal, but you stay in that optimal window of tolerance. And the result is, is somatic transformation. So that what happens is, the, somebody might hear a firecracker on the 4th of July and go, whoa, I don't like the way I feel about this and I might not choose to attend a fireworks display, but it's like, I know that I'm here now, this is, I'm hearing fireworks, it's the 4th of July, I am not in a battle zone, and I can tolerate some discomfort around hearing that noise. It's not my favorite noise, but I'm okay with it. That's what you're striving for. That's the transformation. So, oh, assuming that there's somebody out there other than in the fourth row that doesn't know what EFT is, let's step back a moment and then fly forward. So EFT, beside electric funds transfer, stands for the emotional freedom techniques. And um, I've done several videos and articles on the history of how it developed, and it is appropriate in another um, lecture to really know that the groundwork and the foundations for EFT are based on many predecessors. First and foremost, we would say, you know, thought field therapy was the earliest predecessor to EFT, but there are many different people in research and science and neuroscience and psychology that have all laid the foundations for what EFT is. I was just going to pull a research-based definition um, that Dawson used in a, re in a recent um, RCT trial that was EFT he describes as a brief exposure therapy combining cognitive and somatic elements, especially in this one on PTSD and distress symptoms related to that. Um, there are some wonderful studies right now. There are probably no studies more um, voluminous in EFT than regarding the effectiveness with PTSD. You know, we're looking at 70, 80, 90 percent resolution of PTSD-related symptoms in war veterans. Phenomenal. Um, so when we move into what EFT is, basically what are they? Well, it looks something like two parts. Very quickly, it looks like an affirmative statement, uh, even though I'm feeling this anxiousness, even though I'm feeling this fear, even though I'm feeling this symptom, I still completely accept myself anyway. So there's an affirmative nature and an art to that statement. And then there's tapping on different meridian endpoints. Okay, so we're using, if we go through this, we're looking at the different points that are going to be tapped on. This is in essence making it a somatic technique. It's not just a talking technique between two people. This is a very important somatic element that we know that within trauma, to be able to release trauma is really a critical point. What EFT does is it establishes, and you must establish safety, as she just said, because it's really only in a safe place that we can access the traumas in such a way that we can rewire them. There has to be the establishment of safe boundaries in an effective EFT session. You can do it without that, but it's not going to be as nearly as effective, is it? It helps the client resource. It helps them just in the affirmation statement develop that witnessing, even though I got this junk going on that's scaring the bejesus out of me. And when I think about it, I don't want to go there and I don't like it and it doesn't feel all of these aspects that I just want to run away from or hit or whatever, that I'm still okay, I'm not that. And that's resourcing my inner resources to say, I have these things and that's not all of me. And that's a very important resourcing tool as a somatic intervention. 
It offers self-touch, which can be self-soothing, and it's a kinesthetic way of being able to come in contact with the body, which is another key element of a somatic intervention. It offers a human connection, especially when done with another person, when you're working with an EFT coach, and when we look at what's happening with regard to Dan Siegel's work in interpersonal neurobiology, when we have two people in a safe place doing this, it accelerates the healing. EFT also focuses, when done correctly, on the negative, which we mean by we're focusing on that which isn't working. So it also enables us to be able to approach in a gentle, safe way and give confidence that I can approach this memory, I can approach this feeling that is not serving my life in a gentle way that I can gain confidence in moving beyond it. Okay. Um, this is one of the books. I have an example there. There are several EFT manuals. This one specifically on PTSD. And what is the research showing? I have several of the papers, and the research is really doing wonderfully. Um, what does research show EFT to be effective with? Many studies on anxiety. Okay, and we have anxiety scales that are measured very effective with anxiety. Effective with depressive symptoms, which are often associated with PTSD and post-military and military and veterans, so critical. Now, I will say, that I'm making distinction between depressive symptoms and depression because there is a scale of depression, isn't there? Okay, and I want to be really clear that people that are non-mental health care professionals be really careful with terminology, be really careful with boundaries, be really careful to have outside mental health counselors for referrals, to be able to work with especially moderate, moderate to severe depression, but I'm using depressive symptoms as a distinction. Reduces pain and physical symptoms. We have study on fibromyalgia. We have a new, brand new study on tension headaches. So all these are um, peer-reviewed journal studies. Um, reduces PTSD, newest one, thanks to all the work that's being done here. And thank you so much. So all the work that where we're putting our resources here is going toward this type of research so that we can have the research to be working on the base and doing exactly what we're doing here. Um, it reduces the affect of traumatic memories and flashbacks and the emotion, hyperarousal and hypoarousal in response to traumatic memories. It achieves a reduction in stress hormone levels and cortisol levels have been shown to be reduced salivary cortisol levels with the EFT tapping. Um, it regulates the nervous system for both the practitioner and the client, which I um, interrupted Suzanne to say. But basically, as you're working with a practitioner, it helps to regulate both. And especially if a newer practitioner that can get triggered, because we're working with somebody that can be triggered, you know, we're people too, right? That this actually helps to regulate that and keep us in a grounded state. Allows for better interpersonal relationships and communication. And we actually, uh, Lena and I hope to be doing more and more studies um, that we're hoping to do with EFT and relationship and how it affects that. So very, very briefly, you all have handouts that have references, and I just wanted to point out that all the books that we've noted on that are all books that lay people can relate to. You don't have to be a therapist to understand them. And can you flip to the next one? And then um, we've listed some websites that have lots of papers and lots of information on trauma. So this should give you plenty of resources for any of you who would like to do further exploration around trauma. So at this point, we have a few minutes left for questions. So we'd like to throw it open to the floor and see if there are any questions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um What about the person who says it isn't traumatic, it's just what happened? So how do you distinguish whether somebody's, they're just repressing the trauma or they're really like, you know, it's just something that happened to me, I'm not really... This is where you, noticing what this, what is actually going on physiologically can be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, if they're smiling, oh, everything is just all right, and they're sitting there like this, they're probably not all right. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of flapping my leg. 
Sure. Um, you know, so you need to be able to know what the symptoms and the signs are, okay? Or if they're clenching. But the thing is, you can't force anything, okay? What, what, you know, all you can do is just start to work with it. Why are they there if there's nothing going on? You know, so you need to, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's something that you can't give a blanket answer for, I'm sorry to say. You have to just continue to work with the person. You have to say, okay, so it's just something that happened. Um, how did, how's it affecting your life? So you might come at it that way. Well, I'm not sleeping too well or whatever. So you might, then you might say, well, then let's look about the sleep patterns and, and don't.